Welcome to the CEC Report. It's the 25th of April, Anzac Day. I'm Robert Barwick, and I'm joined today by economist John Adams. Welcome, John. Hello. So we're shooting this on Anzac Day, but this is for the, for the viewers on Channel 31. You'll be watching this in a couple of weeks' time um, because we only have one show a week, and we wanted to do a couple of subjects with John Adams. This is a follow-on from the, the previous episode that we, that we called The Going to Rape the Dollar. This episode, this interview is called Australian Politics is Corrupt and Broken. Now, as you know, we're in the middle of election campaign. It's um, so far that, as, as the CEC noted in a press release we put out yesterday, it's con what's conspicuous in this election campaign is what they're not talking about. They're talking about electric cars and, 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 and silly things like that. But there are some fundamental economic crisis issues which must be, must be addressed. We, we made the point, for instance, John, that, it, that following the Royal Commission, which both didn't just show the corruption of the banks, the criminality of the banks, but it showed that the political structures that had protected that criminality were corrupt, right? And therefore, by any normal measure, this election should be a huge debate between the two major parties about who can outdo each other to fix the banks up. Instead, they both agreed not to talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's not cut, cutting through. And of course, you'll be able to talk to your own issues that you know are not cutting through, and that's what I wanted to talk about. But um, John... As you used to be an advisor to the coalition, to a particular senator, senator, yep. senator Arthur Sinodinus, mm -hmm. and therefore, unlike the CEC, you've been on the inside of the political process in yep. the coalition Liberal Party, yep. and so you've got you've got your own experience there. And what and, and it's interesting that um, before I actually get you to talk about this, I, I want to mention this fact: you were, you you appeared on our show the first time last June, mm -hmm. in 2018. Correct. You were warned against coming on our show by, by someone from a major party. We won't have to, don't have to say more than that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But since then, your profile has actually skyrocketed right around Australia. And I'm not claiming all the credit for it. We'll claim a little bit of credit for it. Mm -hmm. But I would say that's because you speak to a subject that the public want to know about, but are generally denied knowledge of through the mainstream media and certainly through the major political parties. And that's what I want you to reflect on today in what insights you have with the message. Just remind the viewers what your message is about economic Armageddon. And since you've been talking about that, why did you have to go public independent of political structures and what response have you got from them? Sure, sure. So before we just talk about the economics, so, so, so I think in the, in, the election, in the context of the election, I think so, so, so the most important number in terms of voting patterns that I have to follow is what is the... Senate vote for the non-Labor, non-coalition, non-Green vote. Because when you vote in the House of Reps, yep. you, you, you will pick the Prime Minister effectively. Yep. And, 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 and so, so this is where you still see a high level of concentration for the major two parties. But in the Senate, um, you know, it is the House of Review, so, so, you, so you, you get more free lens choice. So since 2007, we see at every election that, that this portion of people continues to grow. So at the last election, it was about 26.3%. Now, I think... So if you think of two coalitions, really, Labor, Liberal and Nationals, Labor and the Greens, if you take those two coalitions out of the vote, that proportion that's left is nearly closing in on 30 and may even get to 30 this time. Yes, yes. So 26% of the last election. I do think the number will be higher than in terms of this election. And, and, and so, so, you know, the people who... You know, want to watch me or Martin North or listen to you guys about economics and some other issues. Yep. I, I think I think there's a growing sense of the community. It was a quarter. It could be now getting to thirty to thirty uh, percent or a third of the population. That just says the country's not working. Um, there's a whole host of major challenges that the that the system is not addressing. Uh, I mean, the, the the quality of of the conversation is very poor in terms of our parliament. The, the, the quality of the reporting and the media commentary is, is quite juvenile. Um, and basically, um, you know, there, there's a frustration that the country's headed in the wrong direction and the system in itself doesn't seem to be capable of trying to, uh, try, to try to address this. So, so, so I, this is where I think you look at trust in parliament, trust in politicians, trust in political parties, trust in the media, big business banks, unions, it's all down yeah. um, and, and, and so the level of public confidence in Parliament um, you know has degraded and, and you know 
you know, I would have thought that as a, you know, particularly for those inside Parliament, I would have thought that this would be an important concern that you no, know, yeah. we need to conduct political affairs in such a way that we can retain the confidence of the population. Because when you look at, you know, uh, civil unrest or revolution or etc., it always comes from a point of the system's not working in the interests of the people. And this is where this new channel that Martin North and I have is it, 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 it's sort of born out of that concept. So, uh, yeah, so, so, so that's like one of the key numbers I'll be looking for um, when the voting uh, results come out. And I, and I do expect that, uh, that that will come, that will sort of increase. And was that, because even in the New South Wales election, we saw a, a, a even greater proportion of people saying, no, thank you, Labor, no, thank you, Coalition, no, thank you, Greens. So, um, yeah, so, 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 so I think it's a, it's a growing dynamic and, and, and I, it's something I've been able to recognise a few years before. I do political analysis as well as economic analysis. And I said, well, there, there's an economic picture and the economic picture is we have the biggest debt bubble in Australian history. At the same time, we've got the biggest debt bubble in the history of the world. Um, the Australian middle class is at significant risk of economic catastrophe, uh, and this is where the, this thesis of this economic Armageddon comes from. So I've been doing a lot of stuff around economics. But those who want to listen to me, part of it is people are concerned about their economic welfare, but, but there's a lot of people who are just um, frustrated with the system and basically are looking for alternative voices, particularly on the internet. Well, I think it has to be said, though, among those people who listen to you, we often talk in a way that might sound like we're expecting a crisis to come, and of course we are, but the reality is many, many people are living their own crisis now. The debt burden is crushing them now, and Correct. they're the ones that are ignored by the system, yes. and they're the ones that are, that are hearing the sense in what you and we say. But when you first started saying this, um, as someone with a lot of connections into the major parties, especially the Liberal Party, what response did you get? Um, well, I mean, so, so I would say that, like, uh, if you talk about Parliament itself, I would say when it comes to these economic issues, Parliament is largely ignorant. I mean, the, the, the quality of, of, of economic thinkers in Parliament is, is actually very low. Um, and, and, and those that understand some economics, it's all Keynesian economics, and they don't understand uh, how debt bubbles form and how they collapse and, and macroeconomic stability and a whole host of things like do they that. Even know that. Do they even agree there's a debt bubble? Well, so, so, so I would say that... Uh, particularly in the government, some people on the back bench are fully aware of who I am, um, what I've said. Uh, they do agree privately. Uh, and, and I, I will give a shout out to Tim Wilson, the member for Goldstein, because he did go public on hand start in the House of Reps and, and, and raise some concerns. Now, he got a lot of pushback from, yep. from, from Morrison over that. Uh, but uh, but, but, but the, the frustration among those who are aware of these issues is is that the treasurer and the prime minister, whether it was Turnbull Morrison or or uh, Morrison Frydenberg, there is no either appetite to understand these issues or to study them or to listen to uh, opinions or views which are outside of the consensus of the tre treasury and, the, and, and in terms of the Reserve Bank. So, um, so, so yeah, so, so there is some frustration there. So, so in terms of, you know, I mean, like in terms of the point you made before, so there are people who view the CC with, with, with a lot of scepticism uh, and people said if you go on the CC show, this will affect your reputation in, in, in terms of um, how people will view you. Uh, you know, I have a flamboyant streak and, and how I communicate on, on Twitter and people have said, well, you know, stick to the economics, don't talk about some other stuff because this will damage your credibility. Well, I mean, you know, and my level of frustration, it's not just about eco economics. Look at education attainment rates. I mean, yeah. they, they've been falling for 20 years. Look at the, the crisis around narcotics. Uh, I mean, look, there, there's a whole host of the local population health. Uh, you, know, we're, you know, we're a quite obese nation. So there's a quite... Um, there's a series of areas where I think the country's gone backwards and, and no one's talking about these things. So, you know, uh, so, 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 so yeah, so people want to put you back in the box. Don't say, don't, don't put your head out. Don't say anything too radical. Um, people will look at you differently. Well, but, but uh, particularly on, on the economic front, the time has passed to be polite. The time has passed to, 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 to play the mainstream game. 
um, and you've just got to call it for what it is. And, and so in, in decades gone by, I mean, the internet wasn't available to communicate a non-established message. But I think in, in this current age, we have the ability to, um, to, to be able to do some stuff. And this is where, you know, when I would do the, you know, a show with Martin North, we have at, at least 10,000 people coming to watch mm. us. Whereas, whereas, I mean, you know, before we started filming on the Switzer debate, Switzer said m mainstream TV is dead. Um, and, 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 yeah, and, yeah. and I said, so, so this is the thing that I've told journalists privately as well as publicly, you've lost the audience. Yep. People don't trust you. People don't believe that you are representing uh, the public interest. People don't think your analysis is genuine. People think you're, you're biased. Um, and, and people want a genuine political and policy conversation. Um, and, and, and this is where uh, journalism ha has died because, 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 because they're, they're reporting a whole bunch of crap and juvenile stuff, thinking that they're, they're, they're going to get views with clickbait. Um, yep. but, 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 it, but it degrades the quality of public discourse and public policy conversation. Well, that's, that's the point. The, the, the corporate media would say they have to do whatever gets them the, the viewers. You're showing that by putting the truth out there, you're getting viewers anyway. But let's take a quick break, and I want to continue this afterwards. Welcome back to the CEC Report, where I'm discussing with my guest, John Adams, that Australian politics is corrupt and broken. Um, before we begin, we continue, John, I just want to make the point. Last night, John gave a presentation in our office, a fairly lengthy one, that is going to be a video posted on YouTube in which he has the length of time to elaborate on some of the things I'm trying to draw out for the purpose of this show. So get onto the CEC Report YouTube channel and watch John's lengthy presentation to our office where he gets to go through some of this in detail. What I wanted to, you to comment on now, though, is, is one of the things that you've come across is politicians, in a sense, they're so corrupt, they've been prepared to admit to you that when it comes to acting on the crisis you're warning about. They're not denying the crisis. They are looking for plausible deniability, though. Explain that. Sure. So, so th th there's probably two points here. Um, there, there are a group of politicians. So Tim Wilson went public um, uh, and, and said things on the public record. Uh, there are uh, politicians who I would say are concerned about the economy, and this is these people within the coalition, people on the backbench, um, and, and who disagree with their own prime minister and treasurer. Uh, but but they they are of the view that if there is an open discussion of these issues, it will cause panic and it will be counterproductive. Um, and but but and they want a, a you know a mature conversation behind closed doors of how to resolve some of these issues. But my problem is is that number one, the prime minister and the and treasurer won't engage in that conversation. But two, um, if you want to have private discussions, that's fine. But if you don't say something to the public. You, people will sign mortgage documents thinking everything's okay yeah. when things are not okay. So in this time of, uh, well, let's not rock the boat, let's not cause panic, you are, the, the, the debt bubble can, 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 you Well, know, they're, you know, well, they're actually denying there's a bubble. They, they, they go yeah. that far and they keep sucking people in to signing up to mortgages that within a few months they're underwater. They're exactly. negative equity. Exactly, exactly. So, so, so on this issue of plausible deniability, so um, I would say this is more of a strategy of Maybe, 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 maybe the cabinet, but also the Reserve Bank and Treasury. Um, so it was put to me by a member of Parliament that the establishment knows they've screwed up. They know that there are problems in the economy, um, and, and obviously this is where. Well, I, I did some reporting, and, and you reported on the CC show. Um, um, you know, I think maybe last week or the week before about Treasury officials having secret meetings in Europe, trying right. to understand how to resolve. These, this bank issue around toxic mortgages and toxic banks um, if the crisis were to occur. So, so we know that Treasury is having secret discussions. They're forming up secret plans around how to do this. They won't reveal it to the public. But there is a hope that the course of Australian history repeats itself. We have a global shock. The establishment and their buddies in the media can say, well, it wasn't us. It was overseas. Um, um, you know, we, we you can't be we can't be held responsible. Like in two, which they effectively did in two thousand and eight. That was it, their, yeah. Precisely two thousand eight. What did Gillard say? No one saw it coming. This is what Rudd said. Um, so 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 therefore we can't be blamed. And to a large extent, 
because, see, the economy was still reasonably okay when Bear Stearns happened, when Lehman Brothers happened. So, so I think the public bought it to a certain extent. But, but, but now we have the city market tanking, the Melbourne ta market tanking. Perth is down uh, 18%. The, Dow, the Northern Territory property market is down 20%. Well, people know there's a problem already. Now, um, so, so from here, uh, the establishment could be... Now, if, if this theory I put out last month on news.com comes true in the sense that we have we are the cause of the of the of the uh, GFC the next yeah. GFC if we are the cause of it the establishment in this country has nowhere to hide and there has to be and uh, there has to be uh, accountability held now i will i said it last night and i'll say it again uh, a, a, an australian senator sent me a text message in 2017 and i asked that senator um, when the system blows up who will be held accountable and the senator said no one so, so, so this is, there's a view among the elites that we, we screwed it up, yep. but we will get away with it. And if you look at what happened with the United States, the bankers didn't go to jail, uh, the officials didn't go to jail, the media didn't go to jail for, 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 for uh, getting people into these uh, sort of uh, bad situations. And so this is the establishment strategy going forward. So this is why they're, they're hoping to keep the can down the road, hoping the global shock will happen and they can all walk away and continue with their careers. Well, in terms of being accountable, let's talk about the Reserve Bank because this is your um, pet subject, the, the Reserve Bank, which we call, I think you describe them as untouchable. You, so tell us, because you know, if you had to blame one institution for where Australia's economy is at, you'd put the Reserve Bank at the top of the pile. I think you'd agree with that. Yes. And in, um, not only do you, would they not be held accountable, but they're not accountable for anything now, right? No, no. So, so yeah, so... so one of the key reasons why we have this debt bubble is because of interest rate policy. And interest rates, you know, in 1990 was at about 15, 16% official rates, and now it's down at one and a half. And so the bubble is so big. So you look at the average interest rate over 28 years, it's about 5%. We have no capacity to normalise interest rates to the long-term average, because if we did, the economy would blow up. And so the Reserve Bank ha and, 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 and to a lesser extent APRA have allowed this situation to develop and now they are stuck. They can't raise interest rates because you're gonna see a massive, a massive recession, if not a depression. So, so for me, they screwed up um, and, 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 and you know, they should be being asked tough questions and they should be held accountable and in my view, and I've said this publicly, the governor should be sacked at least. Um, and, and, and after this Armageddon happens, there needs to be some form of um, uh, you know, investigation as to who knew, who knew what when, uh, and then basically certain parties, um, you know, if they knew a crisis was coming and they did nothing about it, um, and, and people suffered economic or social loss as a result of professional bureaucratic incompetence, those bureaucrats have to be held to account. Now, my frustration is, is that the media do not ask tough questions of the governor. Uh, the governor gave a speech to the National Press Club. Um, he was asked a whole bunch of soft questions. Um, when the governor went in front of the House Economics Committee in February, uh, there was no serious questions um, and on, on all these sort of issues in the conduct of the Reserve Bank. And so it seems to me that the RBA and the governor in particular, he is untouchable. He is above accountability because no one's putting the asset on him. Uh, now, I've had um, members of, of the current parliament in the last week, but also former members of parliament have said to me, no, you know, in their view, the governor is not above accountability. He should be asked tough questions. There's a view that because he has a PhD in economics, people are somewhat intimidated to ask you know, tough questions because most of the journalists don't, you know, maybe they've got a bachelor's degree in economics at best, but a lot of them don't. So, so you know, uh, even Switzer said that he's the smartest guy in the room. So, so you know, I mean, so that's why people are a little bit hesitant to, to really ask him tough questions. But and when he does appear before Parliament, he's not under oath. No, no, the thing is, look, that, 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 that is absolutely true. Um, if you listen to the opening of the committee hearing, um, the, the, uh, the chairman of the committee said that the RBA will not be under oath, but they did then say, if you do provide misleading or false information to the committee, the committee may, and this is the thing, may, um, refer you to the House of Reps for, um, for, for contempt of Parliament. Now, I went to the Secretariat after the committee hearing and I said, in the history of Parliament, how many times has the RBA been referred to the House for investigation? The answer is zero. Now, one of the key things that comes out of Ireland is um, 
the, the, the Irish Central Bank, the politicians and the bankers did lie on the public record in the, in the Irish housing crisis and they did so on the basis they thought that um, if we told the truth, it would call, induce further panic, right. it would make the crisis worse. So, so we will see uh, liars coming forward and if there is ever any independent investigation into those lies, they'll say we had no choice because if we, if we fessed up, it'd be worse. All right, hold that thought. Let's take another break. Welcome back to the CEC Report where we're discussing with my guest economist, John Adams, Australian politics is corrupt and broken. And what you were saying before the break, John, is that they would be lying now. You know, you, you just know... You cited the Irish precedent. They would be lying now about the state of the economy in Australia, feeling justified doing it. Y yes, yes. I mean, so, so Eddie Hobbs, um, who, who, who predicted the Irish housing crisis a few years out from when it happened, uh, I've been on the phone with him several times, uh, and, and, and he said, watch for the bureaucrats to lie. Yeah. Um, and if they're ever tested, they said, they'll say, we did it because it was the best thing to do. Um, now, on the Reserve Bank, so Governor Philip Lowe of yep. the Reserve Bank, um, in fact, the latest um, issue of the Australian Alert Service, which people can see on the screen, call in and get a free copy of that if you haven't received one before, has a two-page article by Lisa Barwick on how we need to fix the monetary system. And she, she shows how Philip Lowe, in many, many papers over the years, has written in conjunction with the Bank for International Settlements how low interest rates are no good. Right, so everything that he's practicing now, he knows to be wrong in his own writings. Right, he's actually he's actually said that, but but put that aside. Philip Lowe doesn't have to testify under oath when he goes to before Parliament. Mm -hmm. um, we were informed because I passed this on to you how when a senator wanted doing a banking inquiry wanted to get the Reserve Bank on the stand, Jane, Senator Jane Hume, and we'll talk, I want to talk talk about her in a second a bit more. Senator Jane Hume tried to stop it, and then she insisted that he would only, the governor would only appear um, in camera behind closed doors, not a, not a public hearing. So this is an example where the Reserve Bank is completely protected, right? They're untouchable in this system. And Jane Hume is a key character to do that. Well, so, so and, 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 and for me, that's the key point, because I, keep a, I talk to members of parliament on a consistent basis, and I ask them directly, why are you protecting the governor? And they say, well, he's not under any protection. Well, where's the tough questions? Why isn't he being held accountable? And they're going, oh, well, you know, they give me all, all sorts of like, like bullshit excuses. So, so, but but, but I, I don't know. I mean, all I know is, is that there's a, there's a covert witness protection program happening in this country for certain individuals no tough questions, no accountability, secret testimony, um, like, like, like this in-camera uh, testimony that you talked about with Senator Jane Hume. And, 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 and our democracy and the Westminster system should be held to a higher standard than, the, than what it is today. And, and so this is where trust and confidence in Parliament ha has, in my view, collapsed. And just quickly, in the time we've got left, what's, what, give us your opinion of Jane Hume, because our, in our campaign for banking separation, She's the roadblock we've run into. She uses her position to block it. You've been someone who's worked for a senator. How do you view her actions? So, look, okay, so the first thing I should say is I've never met the senator. I've never, I've never had, a, 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 had a discussion with her. Um, I have, I did send her an email. So on this issue of bail-in, so I did an episode with Martin uh, in February and we said it's too late, bail-in has already happened. And this was about the bail-in happening in the 1892 depression here in Melbourne. And I basically said to the senator who has said that bail-in uh, won't happen, can't happen, um, will never happen. And I made the point, hang on, it's, it's already happened in Australian history. So John, you agree with us that Senator Hume is using her position to protect the establishment? From the evidence that I have seen to date, it would appear that would be the case. All right. Well, listen, we're out of time. Thanks very much for joining us for these two episodes of the CEC Report. Like I said, catch John on the CEC Report um, channel on YouTube for his, for his longer presentation. And thanks to the viewer for tuning in. See you next week for more.